Eric Weinstein and, and of course, you know, Peter White and, and many others that have alternative theories, alternatives to string theory. Uh, you did your thesis, I believe, in 1986 on string theory, which is, you know, kind of the salad days. And I want to ask you, if you had to appraise, apprise string theory, I asked Mike Turner about inflation and dark energy recently, gave him the same thing. Give string theory uh, a grade, a report card, and uh, break it down into yeah. the sub categories of string theory. Where is yeah. it succeeded? Where does it need more work? And where is the parent right. teacher conference going to happen? The, <laughs> the only reason I'm laughing is because the 25th, and this is not a plug, folks, so it doesn't matter, but it's just because you asked the question. Yeah. The 25th anniversary edition of the Elegant Universe is coming out in August. And on the final pages of this new chapter I've written, I give string theory a report card. <laughs> So part of me is like, hey, I don't really want right, to spill the beans right okay. here, but I'll, I'll give you a rough feel for it. Yeah. So it's a good way of phrasing it because you need to judge a theory among uh, uh, many different criteria, right? And and some string theory has done extremely well and some it hasn't done as well. So let me start with the stuff where it hasn't done as well. Mm -hmm. When it comes to making contact with experimental data, the very question that we began with, string theory is not as far along as I would have hoped, right? So back in 1986, I don't want to calculate how many years ago that was, but it was a long time ago. And if you would have asked me then, and I think most string theorists at the time, 2023, are we going to know through experiment or observation whether these ideas are correct? 95% of the community would have said, of course, we'll know by then. And yet here we are, and, and we don't know. So on that I would give a relatively low grade, but I'm going to come back to how I'll give the final grade on that in just a second, because the theoretical developments in string theory have been so astonishingly powerful, well beyond anything that I would have anticipated back in 1986. And one development in particular that no doubt you know something about, because it's the most famous development in the last 20 years, this ads cft correspondence by Juan Maldacena. And Ask actually, it's, again, it's a whole great, it's a whole community of people, sure. of course, but Juan wrote the paper that really took the world by storm. The relevance of that, well, it's got a huge degree of relevance, but the relevance to the experimental question is interesting because once we learned, as we did with Juan's insight, that string theory is not as a radical separation from previous methodology as we once thought, which is a great development. There's a deep connection to older techniques that are still at the forefront because there are most powerful techniques, quantum field theory. Once you learn that quantum field theory and string theory are joined at the hip, which is what Juan showed us, quantum field theory is the most powerfully tested theory in the history of, of particle physics, in the history of quantum mechanics. It's a framework that works. Tested in, in what sense? Tested in terms of internal consistency, philosophical expediency, in what way has it been? I'm talking flat-footed here. Mm -hmm. Take the standard model of particle physics. It's mm -hmm. a particular quantum field yeah. theory. And that particular quantum field theory makes predictions that we can confirm. I mean, oh, the yeah. uh, you know, take the magnetic moment of the electron, Third right? Decimal place. Yeah, place. that's mm -hmm. is, is that not the most insane? I think it's the most accurately known number. Yeah, so so time. so think about the fact that you can do a calculation using this framework of quantum field theory, it agrees to observation to that many decimal yes. places, right? So, so that's the sense in mm -hmm. which these ideas have been rigorously tested. When you learn that that framework is intimately connected to the framework of string theory, that they're not these two radically different things, which is what we initially thought, it doesn't prove string theory, of course, but it shows you that we are within the same universe of ideas all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And that to me mitigates to some extent that string theory has not gone as far as we had hoped mm -hmm. to actually make an experimental prediction that we can confirm. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it has joined together with the most experimentally tested approach, that is good. That's strong. Did I leave somebody out of the uh, uh, Eric discussion? Weinstein, oh, Eric. Your friend, you guys have debated and uh, yeah. had a memorable exchange at the IAA conference where he said something and you said, well, maybe we were over exuberant. He said like the My Lai massacre as, <laughs> as only Eric Weinstein right. could do. Brian Green. Like I had this interchange with Brian Green where I said, we're not being honest about the failure of string theory. And Brian's like, oh, well, maybe we were a little bit exuberant. And I, I blurt out Institute for Arts and Ideas. I blurt out, 
That's like saying Milai, Milai was irrational exuberance. No, you put a lot of people's careers in the, in the shredder. So his geometric unity theory, which features some testable predictions. And again, I'm an experiment. Yeah. Guess, right. So I'm looking for, well, what things could we do? Say, how would the prediction of Garrett's theory or Stevens theory or Ava Silverstein, you know, any idea? How will that affect observables that, say, the Simons Observatory can measure? One of the things right. we can do is measure abundances. We can measure, look for spin-dependent uh, phenomena and those theories. And I think the thing that Eric always harps on is that we don't, we seem, not to say we, collectively as physicists, and I'm including myself, uh, even though I'm not a theorist, but um, in, in the things that seem to not trouble us, troubles Eric. In other words, why is it that we have three flip families of fermions or, and we don't have an explanation? Yeah. For it. We just we just sort of know it as a taxonomy. And as Feynman said, just because you know the name of something tells you bubkis about it, right? Does that trouble you? I mean, yeah, is no. that part of- Hey, if you go back, yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned my thesis, yeah. which I haven't thought about in a very long time. Yeah. But um, you know, the point of that thesis was to try to answer why there are three generations from a string theoretic perspective. Right. And way back then, there were only a handful of known shapes for the extra dimensions that string theory requires. And in string theory, the number of generations of particles is related to a geometrical quantity in the extra dimensions, half the Euler characteristic for those who are keeping score at home. And so if you have three generations, you're looking for Euler characteristic okay. six. Okay. And there were only really three known examples that had been constructed around those times. And with a colleague, another graduate student at Oxford, we proved that two of them were actually the same. Ah, so you unified. So, so we unified them. Time. So we're sort of down, you know, the by generation. one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I may be aggrandizing, but I think we also pulled in the third one. So I think we basically got it down to one if mm -hmm. I'm if I'm. I may be being generous wow. with myself 40 years later, but it was it was one or two. I believe it was one. And so what we did was we then went further and tried to calculate the mass of the electron or the mm -hmm. mass of the other particles from this particular geometrical form for the extra dimensions. And at that time, with the limited mathematical understanding, which has since become much more deep, we got partway down that road. But as we did, more and more shapes for the extra dimensions were discovered. So all of a sudden, this motivation to study one, well, if there are only four or five total and only one with three generations, of course you're going to study it. But then when there are 500 or 10,000 or 10 to the 500, your motivation for studying any specific example drops precipitously. So that is the historical way. But yes, does it, does it intrigue me, this question of why there are three generations? Absolutely. 